there's going to be a last generation of mortal humans. It might be us. It might be the generation before us. It might be five generations time. But someone is going to be mighty annoyed. <laughs> Someone's going to be the last one, aren't they? There's going to be one person yeah. who'll be the last person. Oh, if I die and I'm the last one, I'll be pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> Happy New Year! To start off 2021 on the On The Edge with Andrew Gold podcast, we've got scientist Dr. Andrew Steele to talk about living forever and how we might cure aging in the coming decades and centuries. What better way to start the year, although if it's anything like 2020, you may not want to live forever. Anyway, Andrew's new book, Ageless, has just come out. Get it on andrewsteele.co.uk slash ageless. It made for a fascinating read. I was up all night hoping to find the answers because I've always loved the idea of staying young and living forever. Many of us like that concept, while others don't. And we'll discuss why some people don't like the idea of living forever. What I would say, most of you listen to this on audio only, but if you're ever going to check out the YouTube page, youtube.com slash andrewgold1, or just type on the Edge with Andrew Gold podcast into Google, YouTube, whatever, you'll find it. This is the time to do it because Andrew's video, Andrew Steele's video, not mine, but it's mine as well, is absolutely gorgeous, shot with a pair of of top-of-the-range cameras. It's like a real nice setup, and it was just... It makes such a difference editing something so lovely. So just Google YouTube on the edge with Andrew Gold or type youtube.com slash andrewgold1 to find it. Do subscribe to the channel while you're there and subscribe to Andrew Steele's page, youtube.com slash drandrewsteele, where you'll find incredible 4K, beautifully shot science videos explaining things in a way that makes sense, even to idiots like me. In today's episode, we talk about why people are so hostile to the idea of living forever, why it's always portrayed as a negative, selfish and unattractive thing, while death seems to be a positive, heroic and noble thing. We look at tortoises, jellyfish and worms, gene therapy, not Levi's, and how we might overcome such potential immortality issues as overpopulation and a poor, rich divide. We talk about whether it's really possible to die of a broken heart and whether women will be able to have babies at much older ages. And we discuss something called cell senescence, which is when cells in our body, as I understand it, stop dividing. Apparently they normally divide, but when they stop dividing, that is a big part of what we would call aging. And we look at how we ourselves might extend our lives and live into the coming millennia. Next week's episode is with Canadian ex-Muslim human rights activist Yasmin Mohammed. But here's my conversation with Dr. Andrew Steele. You've got a great name, by the way. I mean, you know what's funny? I, I don't come across many that many other Andrews, so I always get a bit excited when oh, I do. Oh, really? I've come across loads, yeah. And there was There was even... I, there's an Andrew Steele who's uh, an Olympic sprinter who I've occasionally been confused with. <laughs> Not a terrible thing to be confused with. I'm quite happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a... Did you know the singer Andrew Gold? No. He did. Like, There's a few songs you might know. Oh, oh, what a lonely boy. Did you know that? No. I don't think so. I mean, maybe. What era is he? 80s or something. Okay, maybe a little bit before my time. That's my excuse. <laughs> yeah, me too. He, he died about... 10 years ago and uh oh, I right, reading, okay. yeah i read in the paper andrew gold dies which was a really sort <laughs> of, oh no but hang on what <laughs> really meta moment god i've been watching your youtube channel which is brilliant and oh, your you. biggest video uh, got a lot of stuff was the color stuff which i mm. loved you know because i was it just works so so beautifully what what is your background in in science yeah so i did a physics degree because i, I love physics at school i was actually originally drawn into science by astronomy because i used to look up at the stars and just think wow you know i really want to be a theoretical astrophysicist which i think i told my mum when i was about nine oh. um so i just <laughs> followed that path through school and then i even i did a physics degree i did a physics phd as well but towards the end of that phd i started reading a bit more about aging biology and i decided that I've always sort of wanted to make a difference with my career. And I thought that is the single most important. I mean, we'll go into all this, but it's the single largest cause of human suffering. You know, it looks like we can do something about it. I really need to move into this. need to get, you know, go into biology, learn a bit of the sort of background, try and make sense of this stuff. And that's what then I ended up becoming a computational biologist to try and transfer some of the sort of numbers and physics skills that I had, you know, computational programming skills that I had from my physics background into biology. Was it then at all something that 
did it keep you up at night as a teenager as it did for me for example like oh god i'm gonna die at some point i've had the odd existential crisis i guess i suppose we all have mm. but it's not something that ultimately drives me because i think a lot mm. of a lot of journalists have asked me oh you know have you had some terrible experience with death did you have some relative like die very right when you were young or you know or something like that but actually i think i've been driven to it quite um sort of mathematically numerately rationally uh, not to you know disparage people who've had terrible experiences with death is irrational but because i when i started coming across these ideas um so as i said aging is the single largest cause of human suffering um we of the 150,000 people who die every day about 100,000 of them die because of aging and that kind of statistic, it just made me think, you know, this blows all other human problems out of the water. It's not to say that th- other things aren't important. I, I seriously consider going to climate change research as well. Um, but it's just such a massive problem. And the, the other thing, I, I often tell people that I changed career because of a graph, which is a little bit glib, but only a tiny bit, in that um, it's this graph of your probability of death as a function of how old you are. So when you're in your 30s, I'm in my 30s, my odds of death are something like one in a thousand every year which, you know, those are reasonable odds. Obviously, if that continued, I'd live on average another thousand years. I'd live to a thousand and thirty something, which is, you know, fine. I'd be happy with that. Um, Obviously, things don't continue like that. Your odds of death double approximately every seven or eight years. And that means that although it starts small, we've all had a sort of crash course in exponential growth over the last year, haven't we? What with the coronavirus pandemic? So you can see it starts out very small, but suddenly gets very, very big very quickly. By the time you get to 80, your odds of death are about one in 20 a year. And by the time you get to 90, if you're lucky enough to make it that far, your odds of death are almost one in six, which means you're sort of, whether or not you make it to your 91st birthday is determined by the roll of a dice. Mm-hmm. And sort of understanding that that must be caused by some underlying biological phenomenon, that just really blew my mind. And I thought, you know, this, if this is something that we can intervene in, the evidence is that we can, this is something we should do something about. And yet you say in, in Ageless, your fantastic book, nobody actually dies of aging. Is that right? Yeah, I think there's this sort of myth. Um, and in fact, even, I actually can't remember when it was, but about 50 years ago, it was still possible to write died of old age on a death certificate. Whereas these days we understand that that isn't a thing. You know, you don't just sort of become effectively too old to live in your body anymore. Something has to kill you. And that's something, the biggest single killer is cancer. Uh, sort of come, bringing up uh, the charge behind it is heart disease. You've got stroke, you've got dementia, you've got all these horrible diseases. And it's not just about the fact they kill you. It's the fact that for years, maybe decades beforehand, they're slowly sapping your independence. You know, if you've got heart disease, you might get to a point where you can't go up the stairs. You can't play around with your grandchildren just because your heart's in such a state. And so I think this, there's this sort of myth that, you know, perhaps you'll just have a heart attack and uh, you'll you know, go silently in your sleep aged 85 and that's what dying of old age is really like. But I think um, the reality for most people is that they, you know, sort of begin to suffer over years and decades and eventually one of these diseases, uh, things that we do typically associate with being causes of death, gets severe enough to take your life. It's definitely enough to keep you up at night and it keeps me up at night, especially I remember, I, again, the reason I asked before about maybe when you were a teenager or something, because I think it hits a lot of people when they're teens because it's the first time you sort of yeah. realise like what it actually means. You're aware when you're eight or nine, but you sort of, you really get it when you're a teenager. Like, wow, oh my God. Why Why is it then seen, uh, I, I think you talked about people being very hostile to this and I think I thought about literature, for example, um, and, and so Harry Potter, you know, the people who want to live forever are t- tend to be the evil ones in books the bad ones want to live forever immortality is a sin yeah. in some way why do you think that is i'm really fascinated by the psychology behind that because so the first thing to say is that i don't want to live forever for the sake of living forever in that the reason as we've sort of already gone through the reason i'm so passionate about this is because it's the largest cause of suffering it's the cause of all this disease it's the cause of all this you know pain all these years and years when you're losing your independence so that's what really drives me i wonder if it's partly because because the aging process has been inevitable for the whole of the history of life, basically. It's yeah. something that now, you know, finally we're sentient beings, we can self-examine, we can, you know, try and understand what it is that our place is in the universe. We have to try and make sense of that and come to terms with it. Because, you know, ultimately, until, you know, the present day or even, if, you know, years into the future, there's nothing we can actually do about it. And so I think people sort of ascribe this nobility to death, which I just find completely impossible to comprehend because... You know, people say death gives life meaning and stuff like that, which sounds like a sort of nugget of philosophical wisdom. But I think if you break it down, it just doesn't bear close examination at all. So if you think about, you know, the last time you applied for the for a job or you know tried to get a promotion or the last time you asked that someone out on a date, you weren't doing that because you're going to die in 60 years time. <laughs> You were doing that because, you know, you were hoping that it would make your next week or month or year of life better. And ultimately, I think most of us are driven by quite short term goals. You know, sometimes we might plan a holiday a few months in advance or think about, you know, somewhere we want to move in the next five or 10 years or where we want our career to be. But 
you know, I save for a pension, I guess, but largely I'm not really planning my life around where I'm going to be at age 80 or age 90 or you know, yeah. p- potentially even beyond if we can extend life. So it's almost a fixation with death, but it's a fixation with sort of putting it to one side and trying to explain it away as something that we don't really need to worry about. And I find that really odd. I just, I, mm. I, I guess I've had years to sort of come to terms with thinking about it in this way, but now I just, perhaps if you know, you'd spoken to me 10 years ago, I could have made a bit more sense of it, but right now I just find it completely baffling. <laughs> I think it is as well. I, and that, that, I think you make a really good point. The nobility in death uh, that we're all sort of trying to create, it's, it's clearly, it must be some sort of cognitive dissonance. I mean, you talk to people all the time who will say, oh, I would never want to live forever. And you just say, well, what about a thousand years? And they go, oh, no, I wouldn't. And I just think, I, can't, I don't believe that. Well, a thousand years would be great. I feel a little bit like if, you know, if we were able to live, like if it was typical for a human to live for 10,000 years or so, and then I've gone to the doctor and they've said, we're really sorry, Mr. Gold, you've got, uh, you've only got 70 years left. And it would be like, oh my, oh, it'd be, it's a, it's a death sentence, you know, so yeah. <laughs> I'm happy you're, you're doing this work. What, what can we learn from tortoises and worms and jellyfish? <laughs> well, I think, um, so we've said that aging is inevitable and it has been for, you know, the whole history of the human species, certainly. But as we look around the animal kingdom, I think one of the most exciting things is that um, a lot of people think that aging is inevitability because of the laws of physics. So this idea of the second law of thermodynamics, that things tend to sort of tend towards disorder, i.e., you know, things fall apart with time. And we see that with machines, you know, you know, back in the era of steam when the laws of thermodynamics were being developed, they were all inspired by the Victorian machines all around these scientists. And I think that people, and in fact biologists, thought that aging was very much the same kind of phenomenon for a long time. Um, so you've got to ask yourself, you know, is, is, is trying to sort of do anything about aging, is it against the laws of science in some way? Is it against the laws of physics? Is it against the laws of biology? And the best examples that show us that it isn't against any scientific law is that there are some species that don't age. So what I mean by that, let's unpack that a little bit. Um, I mentioned earlier that humans' risk of death doubles every seven or eight years. And in some statistical sense, that sort of defines our rate of aging. And so you can look at, look at other animals, look at you know dogs and cats, for example. We know that our pets, they actually age in surprisingly similar ways to humans. You know, they get old, they get frail, they can get cataracts, they can lose their hearing. Very, very similar yeah. to old people. And they often die of cancer or heart problems or, you know, whatever it is. But they do so on a much shorter time scale than their owners. You know, we know that we can have, you know, three, four, five pet dogs during our life time easily mm. uh, and then if yeah. you look at mice you know they live even shorter but then at the other end of the scale if you look at um, giant tortoises are my favorite example perhaps because they're on the cover of my book um, and those animals have something called negligible senescence and what that means is a chance of death that doesn't vary depending on how long ago they were born so a tortoise's chance of death is actually quite high per year it's about one or two percent so that's higher than you know a young adult human but because that risk of death stays constant isn't doubling that means it isn't constantly getting bigger and bigger and you don't have this sort of wall of mortality coming up for you later in their lives mm. and that means that they can you know a lucky few tortoises can live for hundreds of years or you know at least up to 200 so mm. i think that's really a noble aspiration for humans because what you can see is that your risk of death doesn't have to depend on how long ago you were born. It's not some immutable law of biology. It's not just animals falling apart like machines. We can um, work out how to create these processes of repair to keep our bodies maintained for extended periods. And the question is, how can we sort of take some of those lessons from tortoises and apply them to people? Why don't tortoises live for a thousand years then? I guess if you watched enough, they would. It's just a sort of question of statistics. So say, say they had a 1% chance of dying a year. You'd expect the average tortoise to live 100 years. But mm. then, you know, a few of them would, would, would still be alive after that time. And so it's just a question of, you know, they've got, they've got to roll this 100-sided dice. If it never comes up with 100, uh, up to 1,000 years, they might live that long. But the fact mm. is, you have to be a very, very lucky tortoise with a 1% risk of death every year to make it all the way to 1,000. I think a good example, actually, is a, another a weirder animal that's also, we think, negligibly senescent called a hydra. It's a tiny little pond-dwelling creature, I think a few millimetres long and it's very very simple and um, it was originally of interest to scientists because it's got these incredible regenerative powers so uh, you chop off basically any bit of a hydra and you'll end up with two hydra the original one that you started with and the bit that you chopped off will regrow into an entirely new hydra so scientists were fascinated by this incredible mm. regeneration but what they noticed as they started studying it in the lab was they, um, they they didn't seem to die at an increased rate again depending on how long ago they were born and their risk of death is so low. Obviously, we haven't done this experiment because a thousand years hasn't elapsed yet. But if we, we predict if their chance of death continued on out into the future, about 10% of them would still be alive in a thousand years' time. It's the same with the tortoises. There's not a hard limit on their lifespan. And there very nearly is on humans because our risk of death shoots up so fast when you get to old ages. You basically statistically can't get past 120. It's very, very hard. Whereas if you're a tortoise, it's not impossible. There's not a wall there. You just have to get incredibly lucky.
The Hydra thing sounds a little bit like a, like replacing parts of a bike because I just think if it lived a thousand years, but is it the same Hydra? It's had like its head chopped off. It's had its feet. It doesn't have feet. It's had its feet chopped off and it's just regenerated itself enough times. I mean, what's going through its head? It's a fascinating question, isn't it? And, and what, you know, what does it even mean to, to yeah. say it's the same Hydra? Because I, I think probably all the molecules in the Hydra will be different. But if you just replace them one at a time, it, 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 it turns into philosophy quite quickly, doesn't it? You talk a lot in your book about, you write a lot, or talk about, I suppose it's both, isn't it? Depends if you're listening to the audiobook, I guess. <laughs> I haven't heard the, I didn't know there was an audiobook. Is there an audiobook? All right, so if you want to listen to my voice for 10 hours, I can recommend nothing better. <laughs> what was it like reading out a whole book? It must be quite, your mouth must it's get quite dry. Baffling. It's It's particularly, I mean, there, there are pros and cons to reading your own book. Um, the con is <laughs> by day four you're going absolutely crazy particularly because obviously you don't get it all perfect first time so you have to reread passages and it can really yeah. do your head in the big advantage is that um, there are a few changes that we made on the fly and obviously if you've got some actor in doing it they can't just go like mauling the text in order to make it sound better because th- there, are, there are certain bits yeah. where it just doesn't make sense read out loud and as the author you can go in and be like actually I think we'll change that a little bit so there are a few uh, places okay where the sort of the text of the audiobook is different from the text of the actual book because it just didn't work like footnotes for example are really hard in audio would you have had stephen fry doing it would you have liked that oh definitely i mean who wouldn't who wouldn't <laughs> like to hear stephen fry reading anything whether it's their book or not <laughs> I remember, I can't remember which line it was. There was a line of the Harry Potter books that he had to call J.K. Rowling and ask if she would change it. And she said no, Hmm. because he couldn't say it. It was like three words that for some reason, no matter how many times he tried, he couldn't (laughs) say it. And she said, nope, you're just going to have to do it, Stephen. So I can well imagine that frustration. (laughs) And the the worst thing, reading your own book is any really complicated sentences, you've got no one to blame except yourself. You're like, why did I stick in that huge bit about Korean dynasties? I've now got to say all those words. I literally uh, sent an email to the professor who I'd got some of the data from for that section and asked him to send me a voice memo of the names of the various Korean eunuchs who I had to say. Oh, my God. Well, that was a point, wasn't it? So so the eunuchs tend to live longer. So Mm. why is that? Why is that? It's a fascinating question, and the the sort of short answer is we don't entirely know. You know, as a young man, there's a serious question as to if I did have my testicles removed, how much longer could I live? And obviously these eunuchs are castrated at a very young age, so it's not may, maybe whatever magic happens to their bodies that makes them live longer. Maybe a crucial part of that happens in puberty, and so we sort of miss the boat. But it is really weird in that there's this thing that's sort of not at all medically implausible that I could do that might extend my life by like you know maybe even 10 or 20 years looking at some of those eunuch genealogical records the reason that I bring it up is because castration is a really um, well studied uh, sort of phenomenon in the lab to regenerate a part of your body called the thymus which is an organ that a lot of us haven't heard of it's a tiny little organ just behind your breastbone uh, sort of in between your breastbone and your heart and that although it's very small it's very important for your immune system it's the training academy for a type of immune cell called t-cells which again we're all becoming immunology experts because of coronavirus aren't we but they're the sort of cell that destroys virus infected cells amongst other things and um as you age in fact very rapidly the thymus withers it seems to halve in size about every 15 years so even by the time you're a teenager you've already lost half of it so by the time you're in your 30s you've lost most of it by a substantial fraction and it just keeps on getting smaller and smaller. And so you get less and less of these new T cells, and you're having to rely more and more on your immune system's memory of diseases it's seen in the past. But if you castrate uh, rats and mice in the lab, what you find is their thymus uh, can grow back a little bit or just stop degenerating at the same speed, and their immune function stays stronger into later life. So obviously, you know, back in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, when these eunuchs were living in the Korean courts, and uh, you know, they were keeping detailed genealogical records, which shows us how long these eunuchs, these castrated men used to live. They obviously didn't record their thymus at the same time so we can't be sure that was the effect that made them live longer but there's some suggestive other experiments that you know that show that that could be one of the contributing factors have you personally done a lot of the sort sort of uh, working on mice and stuff there's a lot of talk of mice Uh, obviously these are things that someone like me a lay person doesn't i don't even think about it and of course yeah you have to do things on mice and things obviously i've heard of that have you done that yourself have you been involved in that i haven't no so because my background's physics and i became a computational biologist i have literally i've I've been in the lab a couple of times like my first job was looking at nematode worms or I say looking at doing data analysis on data produced by scientists working with nematode worms and there are a couple of times uh, the worm scientists like call me into the lab and say hey we've got a really cool mutant in here do you want to come and have a little look um, because these things it's sort of amazing actually because I, I write about nematode worms a lot in the book that it's absolute linchpin organism in all kinds of science but aging research in particular they're so, that we just got such a diversity of mutations the one that I remember the most strongly is I was called in to see some worms called rollers and um, a lot of these worms and flies, their, their genes have quite funny names, which are sort of based on how the characteristic looks. And rollers, um, they've got a deletion of a particular gene. That means instead of slithering across the agar plate, you can look under the microscope and they just sort of roll around. 
and um you know it, it took scientists years to decode why this particular gene deletion causes the worms to just just you know completely changes mm. how they move could you put that gene <clears throat> into a human and they could become an athlete or something an olympian <laughs> What's, so I don't think necessarily think that every gene in a worm has a human uh, correspondence, yeah. but it's remarkable how many of them do. So mm. one of the genes that I talk about in the book, or a sort of family of genes I talk about in the book actually, called DAF, which are these genes that in the worm um, are related to uh, a life-extending property they have when they're very young. If they find themselves in a hostile environment, they can go into a state called the dower. Um, which is yep. a state where they, they sort of make an environmentally hardened cuticle around themselves and sort of hunker down. It's a bit like hibernation to wait for the good times to come. And you might think that's a, obviously that isn't something humans can do. And even if it is, it probably isn't something we'd want to be able to do, even if it did extend our lives. Um, but actually some of the genes that are involved in deciding whether to take this dower pathway or not are nonetheless found in humans. And they're found in humans who live to exceedingly long ages. So it's remarkable, the correspondence. These, you know, these organisms, they're so tiny, they're, they're about a millimetre long, you need a microscope to really see them. And yet their correspondence with human genes is remarkable. That's from the, the German for duration. I just want to show off that I remember that from the book. Oh, well done, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what you were just saying about eunuchs and living longer, has that got mm. something to do with, there's another passage in your book about, whenever I read a book like this, I understand, I think, 80% and the rest I sort of go okay well you know I, but most of it, it's very accessibly written probably more so than many scientific books so it's, it's it is good for an idiot like me but there was a bit that was like a bit like a trade-off between aging and reproduction cells so if you sort of have it's like because we have good reproduction cells it means mm. that we have a lim limit in our age as well is that right have I understood that sort yes, of yes that's right? exactly right so one of the theories about the evolution of aging <laughs> is <laughs> breathing a sigh of relief yeah one of the things about the evolution of aging is that it's a aging is effectively an evolutionary accident that's the sort of overarching theme of understanding why aging evolved because you might think evolution um the sort of tagline that everyone knows about it is it's survival of the fittest and what exactly is fittest about you know growing old getting wrinkles getting gray hair losing your muscle strength getting cancer like none of these things are going to make you fitter in the wild but the fact is that evolution actually doesn't care about your fitness after a certain age and that age is when you've reproduced because as soon as you manage to have some kids and pass on your genes then you're effectively disposable as far as evolution is concerned it's you know sad to say the idea is that there are certain genes there are certain sort of uh, phenomena in our body that accelerate speed us up getting to reproductive maturity and you know cranking out some kids but as soon as we've achieved that goal then evolution doesn't care about us anymore and it can actually accelerate our decline and you're exactly right testosterone is one of the potential things that's fingered in this um because fascinatingly there is a there's a life expectancy difference you probably know between men and women women around the world in basically any country you look in no matter what its overall life expectancy mm. is seem to live about five years longer than men and one of the ideas is that testosterone is basically a suicide hormone as far as men are concerned they give us a sort of kamikaze instinct that revs us up for reproduction very fast get, make, makes us big and strong so we can fight and you know catch animals but then ultimately accelerates the rate of our aging and so we end up dying sooner than women could i get rid of some testosterone because i don't, don't know if i need it that much and i would i'd rather live an extra five years than have a lower voice yeah that's the interesting thing because i it, it, it's like i was saying earlier it's really weird the idea of being castrated you know it would completely change your your, your phenotype your sort of external you know, how you present it to the world you're effectively going part way through a transition you know sort of sex transition yeah. um so it would massively reduce your sex drive it would change the ways that hair fell on your body you might develop breasts you know there, there are all these sort of things that in modern society we think of as a little bit strange for men to have and so there's you know and certainly you know i enjoy sex <laughs> i'd like to keep doing it and, and you know, would yeah. i want an extra five years if i suddenly completely stopped enjoying sex or completely stopped even wanting it it's a fascinating head scratcher i think i'd take it <laughs> would you go for it <laughs> i think i'd go for it i just but that's it's not that's not having a go at sex i just i just <laughs> you know sex is fine and if it but i just love i like being a lot i like being healthy and living and stuff yeah no, it's fascinating. I mean, the, the, I think the thing that um, the thing that stops me getting castrated is that that <laughs> effect that I mentioned earlier, which is that we just don't know because obviously these eunuchs were castrated as children. One of the ideas behind why um, why it is that developing faster causes us to age more quickly as well is that maybe your body sort of throws itself together in a slapdash way. And that means that it's not quite as optimally carefully constructed and therefore doesn't quite last as long. And so it might be that whatever it is that testosterone does is really crucial during the developmental part of being a man. And obviously the key po point of that is in our sort of development when testosterone matters is during puberty. So maybe by being castrated after puberty, you'd have all the disadvantages, you know, I'd lose my lovely beard and my uh, sex drive, but I wouldn't actually gain that many years of life at the end. And, you know, we just don't know whether that would work. You know, what's crazy is that someone could have done this experiment centuries ago, and now we'd know the answer. We could genuinely make the trade-off between sex and life length. But unfortunately, mm. you know, you and me would have to be the guinea pigs. <laughs>
I guess people could do, um, they could keep records of trans people who transitioned in their teen years. I guess there must be, people must be looking at that kind of thing and seeing if it extends age or, or has any health benefits and that kind of thing. Yeah, it'd be a really fascinating thing to do. Obviously, it's really tricky because there are loads of struggles involved with being trans. You know, obviously we could talk about it for ages, but it'd be a really fascinating thing to try and tease out if there is any, uh, you know, health or lifespan benefits or, yeah, it's, it's a huge potential area of research. Part of the reason I'm sounding quite hesitant, apart from the whole, you know, all the complexities and the fact we're finally starting to acknowledge trans people more, is that this research has a really um, checkered history. The stuff on eunuchs... Um, that's a, an entirely different historical period and hard to comment on. But there was some really nasty research done in the sort of 90, even as late as the 1960s. People were being castrated in, um, you know, what were called back then asylums. Uh, people who were effectively imprisoned because they had mental problems. And some of those inmates were castrated. And some of the best data we have on how castration affects human longevity comes from those places. And so obviously it's really interesting scientifically, but it's such a dark place from a sort of social point of view. So it's um, yeah, something to be really careful of. Oh my god! Why don't we get uh, sort of mutant people every now and then who live a thousand years? It's a good question. I think it's because aging is so complicated. So in the book, I talk about these ten hallmarks of aging, these ten sort of processes that give rise to the way that we age. And the fact is, it affects loads and loads of different aspects of your body. And actually, this was one of the original arguments against. Uh, doing research into aging people just thought it would be so complicated there'd be so many genes so many processes involved that we couldn't possibly understand it um that said mm -hmm. there are exact mutants exactly like this in worms so to go back to those c elegans nematode worms i mentioned before there's uh, a gene called age one and if you mutate it in a particular way those worms live 10 times longer so effectively you know translated to human years which is a bit of a naive thing to do they do live for a thousand years it's clearly possible to do that by altering a single gene the question is you know does that effect scale up uh, to organisms like us? I think the answer is probably no. However, I think one of the things that I found most fascinating, which has literally happened in the last few years, there was a study done in an Amish community in the US. And um, it was originally, uh, it originally started because a young girl turned up at hospital in the 90s with an incredible uh, bleeding problem. She'd hit her head and uh, what they did, they just couldn't stop the bleeding. And they did eventually get it under control, thank goodness. When they dug into what was causing this bleeding problem, it was unknown to science at the time. And there was this doctor in the US called Amy Shapiro who's been like doggedly pursuing this for decades. And she eventually managed to get a study done where they looked at this whole community of old order Amish in, in uh, Indiana. So she had two mutations in this gene that was responsible for blood clotting. And so she had um, blood that found it very, very difficult to clot, which is why she could injure herself and end up in, you know, with a minor head injury, end up in hospital. Yeah. Um, but it turned out that both her parents had a single copy of this gene. And they traced that lineage back through all these uh, people who lived in that community over the last few centuries. And they found that people with a single copy of this gene had no problems with their blood clotting that they could detect, but seemed to live 10 years longer on average than other members of the community. Which is just, I mean, it's not a thousand, but it's pretty mind-blowing that a single yeah. gene can be changed and add a substantial amount to human lifespan. And one of the points you make about sort of adding 10 years, I think a lot of people just think, oh, I, would, I don't want 10 more years of being 90 anyway. But I think your point a lot of the time is that you're aging slower. So it's not your 10 years more of a, as a, like an old 90 year old, it's that you'll be healthier as a 60 year old, you'll feel younger and as a 50 year old. And I think you talk about something called, is it epigenetic age? Epigenetic? Mm, yes. So what? So we yeah. all have an ep epigenetic age. I remember listening to a podcast years ago and somebody, the host, got their, I think it must have been their epigenetic age or something like that. Mm. They got it measure, measured on the show. And it was it was actually, because I care so much about aging, maybe she didn't that much, but it was heartbreaking because she was about 10 or 15 years older than she thought she was. So mm. is that is that right that, you know, I, I mean, how, how old are you? 35. 35 i'm 31 but i might be and given i don't do much exercise and stuff it's very possible that i'm actually older than you are in internally terms of, yeah so is that how that works it can be it's it's often uh not necessarily that simple to divine and these these things do come with an error bar on them unfortunately not enough to compensate for 10, 10 or 15 years acceleration probably is bad news um but I think what they really show us is there is a sort of underlying biological age that all of us have that isn't necessarily able to be boiled down to a single number. But these single numbers give us this idea that, you know, people can be a certain chronological age, you know, they can have a certain number of years since their birthday. And yet biologically, they can be older. 
so to go back to your your very sort of starting point of this the reason that we don't think you're going to live for a really long time in frailty and decrepitude is ultimately because you have to die of something and most of those things that you die of are the problems that cause frailty the, you know the things that make life um less less pleasant and you know painful and that sort of thing so for example heart disease as i was saying earlier you know you can suffer for years you can suffer for decades slowly losing your ability to you know anything from run 5k to getting eventually getting up the stairs or playing with your grandchildren and the fact is that once you have these diseases you know they're to some extent a ticking time bomb that's going to kill you at some point and so if you were to somehow be able to extend it just it's it doesn't make any theoretical sense to think about the idea of extending someone's period of frailty just because the by definition because they're frail because they're at risk of diseases that's what ultimately goes on to kill them and i think that these sort of measures of biological age really throw that into um sort of stark relief the one that i find most sort of simultaneously surprising and not surprising is the fact that how old you look is quite a good predictor of how old you are so there have been some experiments done where they've got panels of assessors to judge how old somebody looks from a photograph and that sort of perceived age as they called it is a predictor of how soon you're going to die above and beyond how old you actually are so it's a bit morbid but you know we all know people who you know waltz into their 50s looking 10 years younger or Mm. other people who look you know absolutely haggard they've often been smoking which accelerates your aging particularly your sort of physical aging so it's it's just incredible to know that is backed up by some actual science and you can indeed age faster and more slowly and we just need to work out how to do it more slowly i think that's good news for my dad because he's 67 he always says you know when i think about 67 year olds when i was 20 they were really old men they were old plus, exactly. and I suppose that's partly would have been his perception, and partly would have been, I think, what you what you point out, which is we're now 30, 40 years on, and a sixty seven year old is not the same as a, as what a sixty seven year old was. No, yeah, exactly. And I think uh, I'm, your dad isn't old enough for this statistic to quite make sense. But um, looking back at when we first set the age of the state pension, which I also talk about in the book, um, that was first set in the twenties in the UK, and um, at that time it was, it was set at sixty five, which is you know the same age we had until about a year ago, I think, for men. Um, and what that means is that, you know, at that time, a few percent of people are making it to 65. And if you did, you were lucky to get a few years of retirement before dying. So obviously these people, you know, physiologically, they're in a state, they were, you know, succumbing to all kinds of different diseases. Whereas even over a lifetime, it's definitely possible to see that people who are 65, you know, who were 65 when your dad was young, who are 65 now, they've got a few years of extra life expectancy in that intervening time, which means they're healthier, they're fitter, they're at less risk of disease. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's definitely something that we can perceive over our lifetimes. He did some walking football, but it knackered him out. Have you heard of that walking football? I haven't, but I think that's yeah. actually something that's, um, it sounds it sounds quite worthwhile, because what I found when researching the book is that the it's those first tiny steps towards exercise that are the most valuable. So it's, it's, I mean, like with everything, there are diminishing returns. I think if you're already running for an hour a day, then making that an hour and 10 minutes or 90 minutes isn't going to substantially improve your health. In fact, there's some evidence it might make your health slightly worse just because right. you're putting your body under so much stress. But I think if you're literally sedentary and you do nothing, um, a bit of walking football, you know, even a 10, 15 minute walk a day just to sort of get things going. It's, it's mm. making that first step that really like pays the biggest dividend for your health. And everything wow. after that is you know the returns diminish and diminish ultimately you know what we'd like what the sort of health experts all say is we should be doing 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise a day but honestly if we could just all you know it's particularly hard when you're working from home because you can literally be sat in the same yeah. chair all the time for 24 you know not 24 hours a day you don't probably don't sleep in it but you know you can, you yeah. can be sat in that chair for an awfully long time there's not even a commute to run for your train or whatever and i think if yeah. you can just try and get yourself up you know try and lose a bit of that staticness it can really really improve your health with a relatively small investment of time corona i've been getting like the dents in my chair now and i think my clothes all seem to have gotten smaller but it's not it's not actually the clothes (laughs) i can't wait for it to end so i've got an excuse to get out of the house more and play some sports and stuff it's this is probably taking time off my life oh does my head in Uh, another point you make as well because we're talking about sort of okay the age where, where a lot of people were lucky to get to 65 we i think have this idea which i think you say is false um that people that the human age to live you know back in 2000 years ago people talk about jesus living to 35 or whatever it was um mm. that was just like a natural age to die at human life expectancy it was actually somewhere in the region of sort of 30 35 40 depending on where you look obviously it's mm. very hard to make these judgments if you're looking back thousands of years because we didn't have you know birth and death records and that sort of stuff but the best guesses are that was approximately what life expectancy was but that number sort of obscures as much as it reveals because uh, what's going on there is firstly there was a massive toll of childhood mortality 
And that applied mm. even as late as the 1800s. The causes of death were slightly different, but basically lots and lots of kids died of infectious diseases that, you know, they got a fever. They might have had birth defects. And, you know, back in those days, we'd have had absolutely no idea how to treat them. Those kids would just have died. And so um, what happens is that you end up with, I think it was about a 60% chance of making your 15th birthday. So barely better than tossing a coin that you'll you make it to halfway through your teens. But if you did make it to 15, your remaining life expectancy, so the amount of life you could expect to live after that, was 40, 50 years. So, you know, you might make it into your 50s, maybe your 60s. Even a few humans back in prehistoric times probably made it into their 70s, you know, maybe not their 80s because they'd have just been too frail to exist in that sort of, you know, rough yeah. and tumble of prehistory. It's a strange thing because it means at first you know it masks this incredible toll of childhood mortality but it also masks the fact that most early humans who made it to adulthood probably lived you know decent but not exceptionally long lives you highlighted was it was it eight ways that you were looking at it's just the top of my head now was it eight ways to to cure aging that you that you were looking at so the book is divided up into these 10 hallmarks which are the processes mm. that go wrong and I tried to map the treatments onto those 10 hallmarks. There are a few that don't quite fit into that framework, but that's basically the way that I, you know, biologists are thinking about how we age now. What is like the most promising for you? I think the one that we've definitely made the most progress on, and you know, the one that's like, I think way out in the lead, is um, a process called accumulation of senescent cells. Mm. So these are cells that are inside all of us. Um, and they were first discovered in the 1960s in a lab in a dish. A guy called Leonard Hayflick was watching uh, cells called fibroblasts, just a particular type of cell, dividing away. And he noticed that after about 50 cell divisions, they just stopped dividing. And not only that, they looked really weird under the microscope. And so um, because they, you know, they seem to be old, they're divided too many times, perhaps, um, they were christened senescent cells, which is just the scientific term for old. Ah. And um, so that sort of started this speculation. Perhaps what's happening to those cells in the dish is happening to our cells in our body. And that's one of the things that causes us to age. And there was quite a, you know, there was some research done on that over the next sort of half a century, but the real clinching experiment was done, uh, they, they'd been done in the last 10 years, basically. There was an experiment in 2011 where they got some mice that had an accelerated aging disorder um, and they added an extra gene that meant when they gave them a drug, this is quite a convoluted experiment, where they gave them this drug that activated this extra gene they'd given them. And what that meant was that the senescent cells in their bodies would commit suicide. And when those senescent cells committed suicide, the mice got healthier. You know, they had uh, fewer heart problems, mm. they had fewer cataracts, they, they even had better fur. So it looked as though they were turning back the aging process. But although that was, you know, a really exciting sort of turning point proof of concept, it wasn't the best that experiment could possibly be for a couple of different reasons. The first was they had this sort of special suicide gene inside them, which means that um, if, if we were to take some of the drug that they used, it would have no effect because we don't have this extra additional okay. gene. Um, and secondly, because it was done in mice with accelerated aging. So that's sort of a, an alarm bell because it's easier to fix a broken mouse than it is to make an already optimized, you know, natural mouse live longer. However, these um, sort of shortcomings have been completely overturned in the experiments that have followed. So in about 2014, 2015, scientists discovered, uh, or they, they went out looking for drugs that could kill these cells selectively, these senescent cells. And they created uh, a class of drugs called senolytics, which just means drugs that kill senescent cells. Mm -hmm. And uh, after trying hundreds and hundreds of different drugs, they found that one called dasatinib, which is just a chemotherapy drug, and one called quercetin, which is actually sometimes found in nutritional supplements. It's often found in fruit and veg. Um, they found that a combination of those two drugs at very low doses, so much lower than the sort of horrible side effect laden doses you give to chemo patients, were able to kill senescent cells in a dish. And they also found that they could kill the senescent cells in natural, naturally aged mice. It makes them sound a bit like whiskey, but actually, you know, these are just <laughs> mice that have lived out their natural sort of two, two-ish years of life. They could give these mice these senolytic drugs pretty late in their life, and it would make them live longer. And again, it would have all this sort of whole range of anti-aging effects from, you know, reducing cancer to incre increasing their cognitive capacity to giving them better fur. Or is it they, wow. For some reason, mouse papers always report better fur. Like, I, I guess it's just because it's incredibly obvious to the researchers that the mice just look great. Yeah. And so it really seems that deleting their senescent cells can roll back the aging process. And because these are drugs that they're, they already exist, you know, dasatinib already has a safety profile. We use it, as I said, in cancer patients for chemotherapy. Um, they've moved pretty quickly into human trials. And they're starting out doing human trials for specific diseases where we know that these senescent cells are a problem. But if those trials work out, I really hope that, you know, in the next five years, you know, maybe the next 10 years on the outside, we're going to see these drugs being used not as a sort of treatment for a particular disease where we know senescent cells cause a problem, but as mm. preventative medicine to delete senescent cells in people whose only sort of disease, if we want to call it that, is the fact they were born 50 or 60 years ago. Wow. Can you see yourself living or myself living you know, over a hundred years with some of, some of the things that will be coming into practice in the next few years. 
I'm a really tedious scientist and hate putting numbers on life expectancy and yeah. things like that. But I do think this stuff is going to matter to a lot of people alive today. So those senolytic drugs, um, mm. it's possible they could be approved in the next few years for these specific conditions. If things move quickly, I'd be really surprised if in the next 10 years we haven't got senolytics being used in some way preventatively in the clinic. Wow. And that means that unless you're already quite old, that's something that's going to be ready in time for you. And this is something that I really realized while writing the book. Like a lot of these things aren't that far into the future. Not, you know, not, none of this is centuries into the future. But I started writing in the, the final sort of science chapter. I talk about the idea of systems biology, systems medicine, which is where we generate huge, huge quantities of data. We've got loads of you know, DNA sequences. We look at every single protein inside a cell. We pull all that enormous quantity of data together. We mix it up in some incredibly powerful computer model, maybe you know, use some machine learning to try and understand how these biological systems are working. And as yeah. I was writing this, I was thinking, God, I'm, you know, I'm starting to sound like some mad futurist here. This is, <laughs> this is completely inconceivable. But then when you think about it, you think, well, if you look at 50 years ago, um, we just discovered the structure of DNA. Actually, that was about 60 years ago. But, you know, it, it, 60, 70 years ago. But, we, you know, we only just discovered the structure of DNA. And now we can sequence a genome in an afternoon for a few hundred dollars. Um, we've got, you know, mm. think about computers in the 1960s. They were the size of the room. They were, you know, a handful of institutes around the world had them, you know, maybe some military installations. Whereas now we've got something that's more powerful than those computers in all of our pockets. Probably got something that's more powerful than some of those computers in our microwaves, to be perfectly honest. So, yeah. you know, if you think about the crazy progress that we've seen over the last 50 years, then even if you think that the first systems biology models that are going to really allow us to understand, you know, the nitty gritty of every aspect of the aging process are 50 years away, then that's plenty of time for a lot of people who are alive today. So, you know, I, I don't wish to be self-sensitive about this, but thinking about us in our 30s, um, we can expect, even if life expectancy didn't move, we could expect to live another 50 years. Mm -hmm. So given that life expectancy is going up by maybe a few years per decade, just naturally, sort of the background increase with medical advances and improvements in lifestyle and that sort of stuff, then, you know, by the time we're 80, there might be another, you know, five or 10 years on life expectancy, mm -hmm. which is a good start. And then if you add on to that, maybe we'll have taken the first senolytic drugs. I talk in the book about dietary restriction memetics, which are drugs that simulate fasting, and they're going to be potentially available in a you know, similarly short time scale. There are stem cell treatments that are getting very close to ready for deployment. We've already got gene therapies that are being used on, on the bleeding edge in the clinic. They're either in trials or they're the, you know, the very first few patients have been treated with these things. So it's inconceivable to me that in 20, 30 years time, gene therapy won't be relatively commonplace. You know, perhaps it's not the sort of thing that every one of us is going to have had. So mm. you think about these technologies that sound out there you know a computer model of the whole of human biology gene cell therapy stem cell therapy it's just almost impossible to me to imagine that that a lot of those things won't be available in 50 years so if we can live that period of time if we can then have our lifespans a bit extended by the anti-aging treatments the sort of first round of anti-aging treatments as it were and we've got plenty of ideas don't let me sell this short it's it just seems incredibly likely to me that by the time we get there there'll be even better treatments and that doesn't you know i'm not going to put as i say i'm going to be boring and not say we're going to live to 120 or 150 <laughs> or a thousand like you know some scientists are quoted as saying in the media but yeah. it's it just seems incredibly likely to me that we are going to we could potentially live much longer than we think we're going to live now based on current life expectancy statistics i guess the problems that we don't know senolytics might cause cancer and stuff like that in the long run i mean there are so there are some potential side effects that we don't know about what, what's what's remarkable to me and that you, you've got to take this with a grain of salt because scientists um the incentives for scientists is to publish big flashy positive results so often you don't get every single caveat in their big nature paper in their big splash in the scientific journals but what's remarkable to me is that in all this work that's been done on senolytics over the last, say, five or ten years, there has been surprisingly little reporting of side effects. And these drugs seem to have really, really widespread benefits um, in that they affect, you know, they, they reduce your risk of cancer, they improve your heart, they give you better fur, as I keep saying. So it, it really does seem that it affects the aging process in this really global way. Now, this isn't to say there won't be any side effects. Um, so to give an example, there probably are places in the body where we don't want to get rid of senescent cells, we want to do something else with them. And a good example is in the brain. So I said that cells can go senescent if they divide too many times. But your cells in your brain actually don't divide very much. There are some neurons that you literally have from, you know, they, they, they're they created in your womb, in your mum's womb, and they exist with you throughout your whole life. And they don't do any dividing, but they can go senescent or something very similar to senescence by different mechanisms. They can get damaged to their genetic code. They can just get incredibly stressed out sort of chemically inside your brain. And they can mm. enter a, a state that's very like senescence. And if a senolytic drug killed one of these neurons, since they don't regenerate, you know, that could that could be, you know, that could be damaging to your brain. That's probably not something we'd want to do. And perhaps right. in those cases, we want to find something that rather than destroying these cells, we turn back 
whatever caused them to go senescent we, you know we repair whatever has damaged them in that way so i think it's unlikely these things are going to be a complete panacea without any side effects but having said that it is genuinely remarkable how few side effects have been reported in fact that I've, I've not seen a single negative side effect of senolytics reported in the literature which isn't as i say wow. to say there aren't any that are going to be uncovered but it's a we've maybe we've just struck very lucky it's possible a friend of mine's a biologist and he was he's quite a cynical guy i guess i guess a lot of scientists are comes with the territory yeah <laughs> yeah he was saying oh but we haven't even worked out worn out joints and sort of bristle bones and things like that and like, he thinks that's that would be a first step and we're not even close to that so i mean what would you say to my cynical pessimistic friend i think it's um so firstly actually senolytics might well be able to help us with worn out joints so one of the things they're currently in trials for is arthritis because mm. senescent cells and actually inflammation that they cause is one of the key drivers behind the uh, process of getting worn out joints and arthritis so that's the first thing to say is that this, this might directly yeah. affect that mm. secondly I think there's a good argument to be made, and we'll find out in the next 10, 20, 30 years whether it's true, but there's a good argument to be made that treating aging is actually easier than treating a lot of the diseases that we currently can't cure. So let's have a think about senescent cells versus cancer. Um, If I give you a drug that kills some senescent cells, and actually this is true of the current uh, sort of senolytic drugs, we know that they don't kill all of your senescent cells or all of a mouse's senescent cells, not by a mile. You know, some of these things only kill 30 or 40% of the senescent cells, and yet we see this huge health benefit. And the great thing about senescent cells as opposed to cancer, so we blast a cancer with this horrible chemotherapy or radiotherapy. The reason is the cancer's sort of modus operandi is to grow. Those cells are trying to divide and divide and divide. And that's why you, know, that's why you get these tumours. That's why they expand. That's why it expands with metastasis throughout your body. It's just desperately trying to cling on to survival. And that's how cancer works. And that means you have to batter it with enormous quantities of horrible treatments to try and smash those sort of vibrant, you know, very much alive cells into submission. And it also means that if you leave a single cancerous cell anywhere in your body after the treatment, there's a risk that it will just, you know, survive and it might might have been resistant to those treatments, so it won't work if you treat it with the same thing a second time, and it can expand and form another tumour. Let's have a look at senescent cells by contrast. These are cells that are sort of worn out, they're at the end of their cellular life. The definition of a senescent cell is that it's one that doesn't divide. So that means it's not multiplying. In fact, you know, by definition, it can't. That's what it doesn't do. <laughs> so right. if you kill 30 or 40% of your senescent cells with a senolytic drug, it's not as though they're going to double and come back a week later. You've got, you know, it might take months or years for you to regain that same concentration of senescent cells again. And so rather than fighting against something that's fighting back against you, it's just a much easier problem to solve. And the other thing that's really exciting about looking at aging rather than looking at these endpoints is that all these aging treatments are potentially going to be preventative. So, you know, we'll give you a drug in your 40s, 50s, 60s that stops you getting cancer in the first place. And a lot of the challenge with treating something like cancer is that um, people who have cancer, they're old. And that means that they've got heart disease. It means they've perhaps got a bit of cognitive decline. They're frail. And so if they spend weeks in hospital, that can really exacerbate that because they're static in a hospital bed. They're not getting the exercise they need. They get muscle Mm. wasting. And that means when they get home, it's harder for them to go on their walk. It's harder to get exercise. And that means that their heart health goes down. And so it's this sort of vicious spiral. You're battling this incredibly tenacious disease in a body that's suffering from all the other consequences of aging. Whereas if we get in first, we try and prevent these things. I'm not saying it's going to be easy because biology medicine has you know, shown that it never is, but it could well be much easier than the sort of attempts to treat age-related disease at the end of life that we're currently struggling with now. I just had a thought actually about um, what you were saying about if you're sedentary and older and you know, you're more likely to go downhill at that point. You often hear about couples and one of them will die and then the other one dies a few months later or, or within a year and they always say they died of a broken heart or something. Do you, do you mm. think that probably has something to do with they, they're living a more sedentary life at that point? They're, they're, they're mourning, they're at home and they just, I don't know, or, or is, it, is there a real thing of they're dying not of, you know, of a metaphorical broken heart? I think there could be some something to the metaphorical broken heart. So there's, you, mm. you've probably heard of the placebo effect, which is this idea that you can, you know, when you're doing a clinical trial, you always have to give not just the medicine, but you give half of your participants a placebo, a sugar pill that looks and, uh, you know, looks to all intents and purposes like the medicine that you're giving, but doesn't have an active ingredient. And that's to cover for the fact that in the case of a lot of diseases, and particularly painkilling actually is very susceptible to this. If you give people medicine and tell them it's a painkiller, because at least yeah. some of pain is in the brain, 
then that sort of psychosomatic effect can work to try and dampen yeah. down that pain, even if you haven't got any actual medication. There's a sort of ugly sister to the placebo effect called the nocebo effect, which is that sugar pills can have side effects. And sometimes those side effects are worse than the side effects of the actual medicine. And this is something that you find, uh, you know, talking about COVID-19, which is obviously <laughs> the topic I keep coming back to, keeps cropping up for some reason. Um, when you give placebo vaccines, you sometimes get uh, side effects of those placebo vaccines as well. There's a mental component to all disease. And, you know, not to over-egg it in order to sort of, you know, say it's all in the mind or diminish people's actual experience of being ill. But at the same time, there clearly is a huge power of psychology. And so it wouldn't yeah. surprise me at all if, you know, dying of a broken heart was a thing, at least to some extent. I had a, a thing like the placebo thing the other day because I um, had a couple of beers and my girlfriend came home and I was acting belligerent. Not belligerent in because it sounds like I was aggressive, like, what are you doing <laughs> home? But I was just a bit like... Throwing stuff. <laughs> I was just a bit like, oh, you're right. I'm just a bit, you know... And it was only a few days later she sort of said to me, you know, I checked those bottles. They were they were non-alcoholic beers that you'd been drinking. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. I was out of it. I was, <laughs> you could have gotten me to run around the room naked. It's amazing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was smashed. I was having hangovers for days. So um, I definitely believe in yeah, that. Yeah, so you, you had the nosy bear effect as well then. You had the hangover as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I've been miserable ever, ever, ever since. I blame all my miserableness <laughs> on that. So so let's say we get to the point where we cure aging, whether it's in the next 50 years or hundreds of years or thousands of years, it, you know, it's done. Obviously, that brings about a lot of other problems, which which you haven't gone into in, in mu that much depth uh, mm. in your book. Um, you know, overpopulation is probably the, one of the first ones people throw at you. And it, I guess it's not necessarily your, your job. Your job is saying, we we can we can live longer but have you given that a lot of thought i have actually and, and there was a there was a big discussion about whether to include a huge section on ethics in the book and i did write eight thousand words but ultimately it just ended <laughs> up being a space issue and also oh. because it, it re i really wanted it to be a science book and sort of concentrate on the fact that there is this really optimistic side of things that we can do this and then you know i, I present some sort of simple parts of the ethical argument um, but I do think there's definitely some space to do that in more depth. I'm going to do some more writing and you know, make some YouTube videos about that as well, because I think it's it's definitely a very common question. Overpopulation is, whenever I've, I mean, do you remember going to parties and weddings? But, you know, back when that was a thing, the very <laughs> first thing people would always ask me was not, you know, anything about biology or how to optimize their own health. It was, yeah, but what about overpopulation? Aren't we going to have too many people? And I think actually, as, as I said earlier, I, I was seriously considering going into climate science. So this is a very... This is something that I take very seriously as well. What surprises me, or surprised me, I guess, when I first worked it out, is that even completely curing death, which obviously isn't something that we could do even if we cured aging, we still have infectious diseases, we still have buses to get hit by, but even completely curing death makes a surprisingly small difference to the Earth's population overall. So to give an example, um, I had a look at the UN's population projections. And if you look at what's called their medium variant, which is their sort of best guess as to what's going to happen to the population over the next few decades, they think that by 2050, there are going to be 9.8 billion people on Earth. So they're just under 8 billion now, um, which obviously is you know, quite a lot more mouths to feed, quite a lot more carbon being emitted, all that sort of stuff. Um, and actually, the first problem that I should have said, that with, I, I don't even like the phrase overpopulation. And the reason is that it sort of implicitly blames the people. And the problem isn't the people, it's the resources that they consume, it's the carbon they emit, it's the land that they use to grow all their food, it's the you know huge areas of land laid waste to extract resources that we all need to go about our modern lives. But actually, if you look at uh, all the people in the world today, the, the richest billion or the richest 10%, depending on exactly how you cut it, are responsible for something like half of the carbon dioxide emissions, which means there are another 6 billion people who are responsible for the other half and are living you know, a vastly diminished standard of living to us. And what I think that means is that, you know, our goal socially, economically over the next you know, few decades should definitely be to bring as much of the world as possible up to, you know, what, quote unquote, a Western standard of living as possible. And if we're going to do that, we absolutely have to, whether we cure aging, whether we do anything to life expectancy or whatever we do, you know, birth rates, whatever we change, we're going to have to dramatically reduce the footprint on the earth of every individual human to make sure that all those humans can have that increased standard of living without totally decimating the planet so that's thing number one we're gonna to have to solve it anyway thing number two so to go back to my un population i said the population in 2050 is predicted to be 9.8 billion i um made the rather brave assumption shall we say which is you know, not, not, not what i'd normally do as a scientist i imagine that we cured death in 2025 so nobody dies after 2025 and if you're a population pessimist, you, you know, you could argue that's the worst case scenario. It's a bit of an odd thing to say if we've literally stopped everybody dying and suffering, but, you know, fine, let's call that the worst case scenario. If you do that, there are about 11 point, I think it was 11.6 billion, but, you know, less than 12 billion people 
on the planet. Now, that is a, a fairly significant jump from the 10 billion that we thought there were going to be before. It's somewhere in the region of 20%. But what that means is that if we're going to sort out climate change, we're going to sort out land use, we're going to solve all these sort of resource problems, we'd only have to work 20% harder in order to do that with the increased population if we literally cured death in five years or four years time now or nearly in 2021 aren't we so you know that's not going to happen so sort of worst case is that we have to work 20 percent harder in order to um in order to try and you know sort out our resources i'd I'd happily cut back my carbon footprint by 20 percent if it meant that we'd solve the largest cause of human suffering and i think you know in reality we're not going to cure aging all at once it's going to be something that happens over years over decades you know as you say perhaps if we're unlucky over centuries I think um, you know overpopulation or overuse of resources just isn't something I'm that worried about. But isn't that just short term? Because presumably that those 12 billion people all have children, and their children have children, and everyone's staying alive. And eventually, you get to a point where there are, there are more people than there are the space for everyone. Is to surely <laughs> within a hundred years, two hundred years? Well, it's the, the space argument is really fascinating. So the to, to take the sort of ridiculous extreme, you could fit literally every human let me get this right yeah so it's in, it's in, you could if you got every human alive today and just packed mm. them together as close as you could you could fit them all in houston texas which i and the, the city of houston so i, I quite enjoyed that because it's called space city is its nickname so there obviously wouldn't be a lot of it if yeah. you were to pack every human into it but and if you were to then instead get every human alive today and pack them into an area with a density of a sort of modern city then you could fit all of them into the state of texas easily in fact i think it might be smaller than that i can't quite remember what the numbers were um but it's 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 an, the actual amount of space that we physically consume is very small. The single largest um, thing that we all use our use you know, land for by proxy is growing food, and seventy percent of that land area is used for production of meat. So that means that if we could just slightly reduce the amount of meat that was in our diets, um, I, I can't remember which what the exact number is for this now, but seventy percent of the land use is definitely meat, and then I think that's responsible for about 30% of either our protein or or our calories or both. So we use by far the majority of our land for growing animals, but it produces the minority of our nutrition. And so if we can just realign our farming, we can start to solve this problem very, very quickly. The moment you said meat, I'm I'm a vegetarian myself, but the moment you said Mm. meat, I just felt the sort of 70% of of the audience just go I'm angry because (laughs) there was a there was a political thing said in a in a a way you think that that would help a lot with overpopulation definitely yeah and I'm I'm actually quite optimistic about um these these different ways that we come up with of producing protein and these ideas of using I've I've started eating some of these sort of vegetarian meat substitutes and Mm. I remember eating this like you know 10 15 years ago corn was just awful like you know if i made yeah. a corn bolognese and i made a uh, meat bolognese it was just night and day because they just the, the corn version yeah. just tasted of basically of wine it just tasted of whatever you put on it and i had absolutely no taste of its own whereas these yeah. um you know fake sausages and fake burgers that are now being produced entirely with plant matter are just mind-blowingly good yeah the beyond meat one yeah you know that one. i've blind tested people because well, I haven't blind tested actually. I've just well, I've sort of said like, oh, do you, what do you think of this? And they, 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 you know, they've made up their mind before they've eaten it, so they're going like, no, it's not quite the same. And you're like, I can't taste the difference. I mean, the, the, yeah. I have chicken nuggets, which is probably not going to do much for my life extension, but I have chicken nugget, the veggie chicken nuggets, and it's it's the same thing. It's it's better. It doesn't have all those horrible bits of probably what was like a chicken's eye. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think vegetarian Scotch eggs are nicer than actual Scotch eggs. <laughs> so yeah i think there i think there are certain niches where the meat substitutes are gonna and as they keep getting developed i'm sure there'll be some that will taste better than meat it's, it's not going to be too long or we might literally be able to grow meat in a lab like i think that you know, it, it, we're not there yet and i think the the first burger they produced cost like thirty thousand dollars or something absolutely ridiculous but if we can get that technology up and running imagine you know people love their marbled beef or whatever we could grow the exact proportion of protein or you know muscle cells and fat cells and just make this you know absolutely perfect beautiful marbled steak that's better than anything you could get out of a mm. cow so there's going to come a point where you know old school meat is going to be you know perhaps traditional but just not as good as the alternative they still resist that um the other thing that people i think say often is is oh they're going to have a society of of rich people who live a long time and poor people who aren't able to afford it so what do you say to those naysayers so the first thing to say to them is that they can't hold both of those beliefs at the same time because you can't simultaneously have a world like straining under the influence of overpopulation and only a handful of people able to access the treatments (laughs) so these are mutually exclusive concerns um it's very easy to hold these like contradictory negative beliefs. I re- th- my, my personal favorite is people who think that they're going to be working until they're 90. And they also think that robots are going to take all of our jobs. Like, those <laughs> things can't both be true at the same time. Um, but the thing with uh, 
it only being accessible to the rich. I think the fact is these treatments just aren't going to be that expensive um, is the first thing. So if you look at some of these treatments, there was a treatment approved in the US, I think a few weeks ago, actually, it was a gene therapy treatment for um, uh, sickle cell anemia, which is a blood disease. And this treatment is going to cost like literally, I think, one or two million dollars to have it done. But when you drill down into that, the reason they can afford to charge so much for that treatment is because when uh, like, when the NHS, for example, that's the one I know about, although this was in the US, um, when the NHS tries to work out how much it's willing to pay for a treatment, it's willing to pay £30,000 per quality adjusted life year, which is a bit of jargon. What that basically means is if you live a year in perfect health, the NHS is happy to pay thirty grand for it. And if you were to live a year in half health, they'd pay fifteen grand for it and so on and so on. So it's just a way of saying, you know, if I've got two medicines, I've got to decide which one I'm going to fund, which one I'm not going to fund. That is like the barrier that they set. So the reason that this thing costs $2 million is because, you know, you can give it to a young person with sickle cell anemia and you can make their entire life better. So, you know, an organization like NICE, which is the body that works this stuff out for the NHS, is going to say, okay, you know, we've done the sums, it works out, we can afford to fund this treatment, that makes sense. If you look at the actual cost of these treatments, it's often in the sort of high tens of thousands of dollars. But then when you drill down into how these are currently done, these are like bleeding edge scientific treatments. They're, they're you know, barely making the first steps out of the lab and into the clinic. I read a fascinating article about something called CAR T cell therapy, which is a, a therapy where you take someone's immune cells out, you modify them outside the body so that they can fight someone's particular cancer. And then you reinfuse them back into the patient and wow. the, the immune cells go and like take out their tumor basically. And it's had absolutely miraculous results in a handful of cancers so far. But the way that this is produced it's sort of artisanal you go into a lab and there are these two you know incredibly highly trained technicians one of them is dripping uh some reagent out of a pipette the other technician stood behind them counting the number of drops that are going in in order to make sure that it rigorously adheres to this protocol if we can start to automate that if we can start to simplify if we can start to understand um you know currently when before these things are put back into patients they do loads and loads of safety tests which is a really good thing but we might get to the point where we realize actually you know we've got the technique down this stuff is just safe and we don't need to test every single batch every single time and you're just going to start driving those costs down and then when you think about how much aging costs us as a society like uh in the uk we spend Mm. somewhere in the region of five or ten grand a year on healthcare each of us through our taxes and a a huge fraction of that goes on the chronic diseases of old age um, you spend so much more in the last few years of your life than you do in preceding years. And so if we could come up with ways to postpone that massive expend- expenditure and keep people healthier for longer, then it's something that governments around the world should be willing to invest in, like even before you consider the huge human imperative to do that, there's a huge economic imperative too. And if you look mm. outside of the healthcare system, we spend huge, huge amounts looking after old people as well. And it's not just the direct costs of sticking old people in care homes. It's also people giving up work because they're too ill to work anymore, or perhaps people giving up work because they want to look after their mum or their dad who's no longer able to look after themselves. So there's just this huge cost to the economy. And I think that once these treatments come down into price to where they're realistically going to end up being, and once we've taken into account sort of the other side of the balance sheet, which is how much ageing costs the economy, it's basically going to pay for itself. So I do a question every every week so i've got a thing called you know patreon do you know patreon yes i got a patreon people sign up to it and people in certain tiers uh of the membership can ask a question uh so Mm. i get a question from from a listener each week and i've got one from uh somebody called thomas hi thomas hi andrew this is thomas from the netherlands with a question for your guest andrew the other one it's about the other side of the spectrum which is how to create life people tend to have babies later and later but there's a limited time there still, biologically speaking. Do you believe that research in your field might help to make that time limit shift more or perhaps even make it disappear completely? Do you know what? I really hope so. And what I found when researching the book was that there's just not enough research being done on, um, you know, what happens to basically women's reproductive aging. Because men, there are, there are reports of men fathering children into their 90s and you know ridiculous things like this so men's reproductive aging doesn't seem to be massively impacted mm. men's reproduction doesn't seem to be massively impacted by aging i should say um what i hope is that some of the interventions that we make that relate to um other you know these 10 hallmarks of aging some of these other interventions are just going to slow the whole aging process down so whatever aspect of aging it is that you choose that's going to be slowed down by one of these interventions however i really think that 
it would be cool if we could do more research into women's reproductive aging particularly and um i honestly think it's a feminist issue because there are so many i mean we're both in our 30s to mention that again this is an age when so many of our female friends are all thinking oh you know do i want to have kids the, the clock's sort of ticking now you know if you're single yeah. and you're 35 especially during a pandemic when it's so much harder to meet people yeah. I, i've got some quite stressed out friends now and yep. I think if we didn't have to make that difficult decision, the fact is there's never a good time to take even a nine month career break. Um, you know, if you're, if you're a high achieving woman and inevitably, unfortunately the childbearing and I mean, the childbearing has to fall on the woman and a lot of the child rearing seems to still fall on women, even though society is getting more equal. So I just think it's so important if we could, you know, look, look at some more stuff specifically about deferring reproductive aging for women. I think it'd be a fantastic thing for society. Yeah, it must be. It's so stressful because they have to think about because I know you're saying, yeah, you say it's it's difficult at any age, but I think particularly in your 20s and 30s when you're worrying about whether you should have a child, that's when you want to really make your mark. Maybe it'd be easier yeah. if you were if you were 50, 55, and you're already like you know high up in your career. Exactly, a senior. Nine. You've like got a secure job. Yeah. I mean, thinking about science, um, which is the career I'm most familiar with. Then you know you do your PhD, probably in your mid 20s by that point, maybe late 20s. You start doing a couple of postdocs, and then by the time you're in your 30s if you haven't already had a kid that you know and the, so these these contracts are three or four years long they're precarious and if you just take a year out in the middle and suddenly your research isn't cutting edge anymore yeah. you're in really big trouble and then if you leave it a little bit later the next thing you do in a science career is become a pi a principal investigator so you've got your own lab and there's no one to deputize to like your 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 it's your lab so you, you know if you take time off it's just there's just no good time up till the age of about 40 you know, once you're a professor maybe once you got to that level it's time to kick back and have a kid so yeah if we could defer it even a few years it could make a really big difference couldn't it for sure that would be good i really loved the book seriously i really enjoyed it and, and oh thank you I've, it is that thing where i'm reading it and i'm I'm sort of every page i'm going yes i'm going to live longer than the next page you're like but this might not work because of this reason i'm like no <laughs> it's really tricky i had a real it was really challenging like balancing the realism and the optimism because i do feel like quite optimistic myself I, I, I feel like there are caveats and there are things that we're not certain about. But the real, the thing I always kept coming back to is this idea that even if you think it's 50 years away, that's still plenty of time for billions and billions of people. I don't want them to do better from it. I want me to do out, <laughs> well out of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, uh, 50 years is plenty of time for you too. Yeah, that's all I'm worried about. You've got four years on me. <laughs> yeah, you, you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle. You're four years too late. If you make the cut and I just miss it, and it's uh, in part thanks to my incredibly successful book, I'll be really annoyed. <laughs> You'll be gutted. You'll be gutted. Imagine that. You've missed it by four years, unfortunately. They brought it yeah. all out just... Uh, there's a, there's you... this article I read a while ago about um, at the end of The Lord of the Rings, the characters all go off on this boat onto the undying lands where the elves live and where everyone lives forever and you know it's all sort of this magical kingdom and they're imagining you know what if you were late what if you missed that boat you're sort of sprinting down the pier at 8 35 they said they were going to leave at 8 30 and you realize that you've missed immortality by five minutes and there's going to be a last generation of mortal humans and i'm not saying it's going to be us it might be you know, it might be us it might not it might be the generation before us it might be five generations time but someone is going to be mighty annoyed <laughs> Someone's going to be the last one, aren't they? There's going to be one person yeah. who'll be the last person ever to die, and they'll always remember him. But he'll become, a, or he or she yeah. will become a will become a bit of a joke, I think. In a thousand years, they'll sort of use it as a oh, older, you know, Michael so and so. Michael's my brother's name, so I don't know why. I've... <laughs> That's why he always gets it. <laughs> <laughs> always gets the the worst of the luck. He always draws the short straw. Oh, if I die and I'm the last one, I'll be pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> If we do manage to climb aboard that last metaphorical boat to immortality, I'll make sure to do another episode with Dr. Andrew Steele in 100 years to see where we are. And every 100 years thereafter. Is thereafter a word? Is that two words? What is that? How You don't often see that written down, do you? Maybe you do. Did you enjoy that? Would you like to live forever? Get in touch with me on andrewgold underscore OK on Instagram and Twitter. I always respond and love to hear from listeners. I thought Andrew, again, the other Andrew, was brilliant and sounded a bit like a slightly sped up Professor Brian Cox, which can only be a good thing in my mind. Remember to take a look at the video clip and subscribe on the On The Edge With Andrew Gold YouTube page, youtube.com slash andrewgold1. The video is really beautiful.
it's been done with these lovely cameras it's a lovely setup as well it's really really nice so do have a look you can find andrew's book ageless on andrewsteel.co.uk slash ageless and see his amazing beautiful videos on youtube.com slash dr andrew steel all of this is in the show notes that's why i've sped over it but go to the little show notes and there'll be some links thanks thomas for your brilliant question about delaying the limits of the reproduction age in women if you'd like to ask a question yourself or get me to read one out for you, sign up to my Patreon on patreon.com slash andrewgold. You'll get benefits like the ad-free podcast, once ads are more frequently introduced to this one, and access to the full videos a month early. There are some other benefits as well, so check it out, patreon.com slash andrewgold. Sometimes I release the full audio podcast a few days earlier to the Patreon members. Basically, I upload it there as soon as I finish editing. Thank you so much to Charlie Adia, Claudine Fraser, and Sonia Wallace, who contributed extremely generously to Patreon this week. I appreciate it so much and hope you continue to enjoy this podcast well into the future. Claudine, Sonia and Charlie, well, depending on how long we live, I suppose. There are other ways to support the podcast. Um, a listener who goes by FTSE1987 wrote a lovely five-star review on Apple. They said, it seems these days every man and his dog are doing a podcast. I'm looking at you, bored, locked down celebs. But Andrew stands head and shoulders above the rest. If you're looking for interesting, challenging and unique conversations with people you've likely never heard of or at least know little about, then sit back and relax and let Andrew's voice soothe your ears and stimulate your mind with an hour or so of decent, high quality content. Highly recommended and have got a handful of my friends onto this. Check it out. You won't regret it. Thanks, FTSE 1987. That was lovely. And the rest of you, please do follow in FTSE's footsteps by getting friends to subscribe to the podcast. It's the best way to make these things uh, spread, I suppose. There was also a lovely message from Georgina Gatson, who said, I really like the way you're able to discuss these important issues and still keep them light with humor and wit. That's a rare gift, I think. I also had some great interactions with a regular listener who goes by East Ham Nicola on Instagram. So thank you, Nicola. It's very much appreciated and I love hearing from you. Apologies for reading out such kind words about myself. It does seem a little boastful, but it's a way of showing some gratitude to my fantastic listeners. And hey, we all have an ego, right? Next week's podcast is ex-Muslim Canadian human rights activist Yasmin Mohammed. Don't miss it.